Hey guys, this is Ash and you're watching Writer Gash. So today I'm doing a Queen of Shadows book talk. But before we go into that, let's look at this gorgeous edition. So as you've seen, I've got the nerdy ink covers and these wonderful stenciled edges that I made thanks to Kingdom Book Designs. I really, really love the red and gold here. I think these two colors go so amazingly together and I just love how it turned out. But let's move on into the actual book. So Queen of Shadows begins when Aelin comes back from Mendlin to Terrison and she basically is there for the Amulet of Orinth. Speaking of, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's because you've not read the previous book, so go ahead and read those first. Anyway, but she's there for the Amulet of Orinth. So in this book, again, we have multiple storylines happening. We've got Aelin's storyline, which is intertwined with Rowan and Adian's, and we also get to see Lysandra. Um, we also have um, well, kind of Dorian's storyline, and finally we have Manon's storyline. So for Dorian, we start off where we left off with him basically being now possessed by Vlag with the collar around him. And yeah, the rest is spoilers for Queen of Shadows, so we'll wait for that. And Manon, she's now in Morath as she was sent there in Air of Fire, and she is now serving the Duke. Uh, Duke, Duke, of Par Duke Parrington. Anyway, so now we begin with the spoilers. So if you have not read Queen of Shadows, please come back when you have. Okay, let's start with Dorian. Our sweet, innocent Dorian has been taken over by a black prince. And you see like certain scenes from his perspective, try him trying to fight the influence of the black and he's really struggling like he's lost himself and it's just so sad um and god and like we see bits of him like creeping in like the scene with manan where he like you could see him kind of just sneaking through the black and then manan notices he's there um, when she's flying in rift hold and he reacts and she leaves a message for Aelin letting her know the prince is still there and got the scene at the end where he finally breaks out of it because Kale meets him like his and Kale's friendship is truly amazing they are really good friends and I think I had like absolutely forgotten all of Kale's redeeming qualities over the years and Kale isn't a bad character is what I'm coming out of this thinking. Speaking of Kale, he has like since he ran out of the palace in Air of Fire, he has been working with the rebels and he's been trying to get Dorian out. Like his unwavering loyalty to Dorian is commendable. So he is working on getting Dorian out and then he, Selena, and then Aelin tells him that Dorian's gone. And you can like see how much that hurt him. Oh, and like he's, yes, dealing with Aelin coming back with like, you know, having moved on from him. He is dealing with all of the like, emotions he's feeling. He feels like he's an oath breaker, his word is worth nothing that he's in absolute disappointment and he's just like lost his faith in life and in himself and he says and does some really like cruel things but so does Aelin and I forgot that for a minute there I think it's really important to remember his reactions are reactionary and he apologizes for them like he owns up to him being wrong and I think he just took everything he was feeling about himself out on Aelin at one point and I, I mean, yes, he was wrong to do that, but I get it. And then like, it's just that his like loyalty to Dorian just makes like, I, that's his redeeming quality. Okay, and that brings us to Aelin. I know like Aelin's storyline is my favorite, but I feel like Aelin's story flows best with Dorian and 
Kales and Manans doesn't as well. So let's talk about Aelin. So Aelin is now back in Rifthold and she is pretending to be Selena one last time. Once she's in Rifthold, she finds out her cousin, Idian, is not uh, who she thought, like, does not work for Adolin and that he has been now captured and is going to be executed by the king of Adolin. So she does this amazing, like, rescue mission. And I think I freaking love these scenes, the way Sarah Jane Mast writes them. The way Aelin knows what to expect. She's like 10 steps ahead of everyone. I love that. Like, give me more of Aelin being a mastermind. And she works with Arabin to get Adian out. And I love Adian and Aelin's relationship. Adian is a really good brother to Aelin. And I love seeing their relationship especially in this book like before everyone shows up their relationship is just so precious and god i love it and then when rowan shows up that scene where she runs at him and adian goes that's rowan white thorn freaking love these characters if you can tell um and then we have rowan who shows up because Lorcan's in town now and Lorcan is there on behalf of the queen and he is trying to get all of the word keys so he can destroy them because he doesn't want Maeve to become a monster and he's undyingly loyal to her even when Maeve would kill him for what he's doing so he's there and Rowan's there to let Aelin know but also because he missed her which he can't admit to her right away but eventually he does and yeah, back to Aelin. When Adian finds out Rowan swore the blood oath to Aelin, God, he said some really cruel things to Aelin and Aelin said some real cruel things to Adian, but it fucking sucks. Like, imagine growing up thinking, oh, that's someday going to be my birthright. And then having someone else just swoop in and take, like, to Adian, that was a huge betrayal, and I get it. But also, like, it's Aelin's choice to make, and, like, all of those perspectives are valid. And I also really like Adian and Rowan's relationship growing and then becoming brothers. Like, at the end, Rowan even calls Adian brother of my court. Speaking of that scene, Lorcan comes back to save them, or help them, when he discovers Adian is Gabriel's son. Gabriel is one of Rowan and Lorcan's friends. And, oh my god. How is everyone related in Throne of Glass somehow? Like, in Sarah Jamas' universe, there's like these connections that are just like too connected. Anyway, so... Rowan is also like a little gossip hound. He basically spills to Adian that Gabriel's his father. He spills to Adian and Aelin that Lysandra is a shifter. He's like surreal of this world. If you don't know who surreal is, read Akatar, you'll figure out what I'm talking about. He's known for spilling secrets. And that brings us to Lysandra, who I absolutely fell in love with. So Lysandra, we first meet in Assassin's Blade, which if you haven't read, you should before this book, because it makes a lot more sense once you've read Assassin's Blade. So Lysandra is a courtesan who Ilan hated as a teenager, but she finally gets to know Lysandra and like comes to view her as a valued friend. And Lysandra has basically given up her freedom to protect a little girl from entering the life she had to enter. And it's just, Lysandra's past is just so heartbreaking and sad and Aelin comes to realize that and their relationship grows. And when Lysandra ended Arabin's life, it was one of my, and it was one of those moments where I wanted to cheer. Speaking of Arabin, another one of Aelin's master plans, she's just like, oh, you need a plan? Here's a plan, here's a plan, here's a plan. She's like Oprah of plans. But, so in order to get money for her kingdom and well, to make Arabin pay, she orchestrates this whole thing. 
So over time, she switches all of like his villain stuff to her name and gets money for Tarasen that way, which like the way he treated her, he just like she totally deserved all that money. Like she was gonna be his heir, so like it should have gone to her anyway. So she gives Arabin the thing she promised him in exchange for saving Adian's life. She gives him the black prince and what how Arabin repays her is to put a black ring on her finger so he could control her. And which gets outmaneuvered because our queen knows what she is doing. She expects this. So she has the Vlag's finger cut off, the one that actually had the ring, and puts a fake ring on the finger and blah, blah, blah. But she manages to convince him that he has controlled her. And then Lysandra kills him that night. And the next day she shows up and basically tells all the assassins that you're out. You want this key back? You're gonna buy it off of me, bitches. And God, when she threw Clarice out, perfection. So Aelin's master plan is to take down the king and take down the clock tower that's stopping magic with Hellfire. So she has Adian and Rowan go use the Hellfire to free magic so she can take down the king. When she shows up, the king is like, I know you're Aelin, Selena, or champion. And they have like a confrontation and Kale sacrifices himself so Aelin could get Dorian out and they could survive. And Aelin and Dorian have a fight off. Dorian, I think, stabs her. There is a fight scene and then the king shows up and the king like taunts Aelin saying like he's killed Kale and that is what frees Dorian. That is how Dorian comes out of the prince's grasp and that is when he kills the king. And before he dies the king reveals that he had basically found the keys. Him and the Duke of per uh, the Duke Parrington had found all of it and the Vlag King Erwan had taken over Parrington and the king had created all of these towers, magic towers, to block magic so he could protect Dorian. And he was waiting for someone to burn this monster out inside of him. And like that's why he went to Terrasen all those years ago, so Aelin could kill him, bring him out of his misery. And it all like makes sense. Like when you think of it, the scenes make sense. And then Finally, at the end, we find out Kill is now paralyzed. His entire vertebrae was damaged and Rowan managed to fix him waist up but didn't want to risk damaging him more and doing anything permanent. So now Kill is off on his way to Antica. I'm pretty sure he's on his way to the Torre Chesme where the healers are and so he can get healed and come back and assist Dorian. And he and Nesrin, who I did not talk about, Nesrin is Kale's ex-lover and also his current second while well, he's in like working with the rebels and they kind of rekindle their thing. I just, it doesn't feel organic so I'm not sure how I feel but they kind of have a thing but nothing actually happens except for like Nesrin, like they deeply care for each other is clear. So Nesrin is going with Kale to the southern continent so Kale can heal. Now, the final line of the story is Manan. And Manan's in Morath. In Morath, she is with the Thirteen and a couple of other witch covens. And the Duke have asked for a black bee coven so he can impregnate them with the flag. And oh my god, Manan initially it's like no and then the what's it called the matron commands Manan to do it and a yellow like coven no volunteers they're like I want the glory so they volunteer in Morath Manan also meets Elite Elite is from Terrasin she is Marion the person we have previously learned of uh, that saved Aelin's life Marion's daughter and the rightful lady of Paranth and her uncle has basically stolen her birthright and basically betrayed Terrison. So in this book, we find out how she was basically like, 
shackled in Morep and how she was in chains all her life. She has a limp. She has severe damage to her like leg and something like she would never even learn how to read because of her <sighs> uncle. If you can call him that. Also, that makes me notice how almost all of Sarah Jimenez's books have like some traits that are common between characters. Might not be the same kind of characters, like elite country. Neither can Farah in the first Akutar book. So like, it's like Sarah Jimenez has like very similar traits in different characters. Elite to, um, Elite also reminds me of Elaine from Akutar, which is why I can't jump on the Elaine hate wagon because I freaking love Elite. Elite was kind of a lack lackluster character in the beginning. And yes, she has a huge story arc here as well. She develops from like a meek character to one of the 13. She's badass and all of that. And I just feel like the reason we don't see Elaine in that way is because we've not gotten her perspective. If we ever get her perspective, we'll get to see how amazing she is. And I think El El Elaine could be an amazing character because I think she's very similar to Elide. Now, back to this story. Elide is basically kind of one of the servants right now. And she comes into Manan's room and she's looking at the map and Manan later like confronts her. She also smells Blackbeak blood in uh, Elide, so she's like, Okay, you choose. Are you a witch or a human? Because if you're a witch, I can protect you. If you're a human, I cannot. And then she becomes Manan's spy. And at the end, when Manan is in Riftold, which we talked about before, um, Alid is taken down to the dungeons by her uncle, and she's going to be used as one of the uh, witches that are going to be impregnated by the blood. But Manan makes it there just in time. And Caltane, if you remember her from the first book, first two books, Caltane saves everyone's life. She has this thing called Shadowfire and she takes them all down. Parrington and Vernon survive, but not many else survived. Elid, like Manan brings a lead out and a lead goes on the run and Manan is like, I'm gonna basically try to convince people that you're dead. And a lead is on her journey back to the north with a token from Caltain to thank Selena. So a lead is technically now looking for Selena Sedotian and Aelin Ashriver Galatinius because Aelin's her queen and she's going to assist them however she can and Selena she owes a debt to because Calatain asked her to take something to Selena. Now, one thing I forgot to talk about was the scene at the temple where Manan almost kills Dorian and Alien has that reaction. Like, she goes feral. Like, absolutely batshit feral. I'm like, that's just, I don't. I can't, okay, spoiler for the rest of the series. Once this book is done, I'm no longer spoiling the rest of the series. I mean, that was a dead giveaway that Aelin and Rowan were mates, right? Like, I know we talk about the scene later in the end of like Empire Storm, King of Sha uh, Queen, King, Kingdom of Ash, that, oh, God, this was like, she even calls him my mate almost. She's like, she heard my, she was gonna say my maid, but she's like, I can't say that I would break Rowan if he knew that Lyra, Lyra wasn't his mate. Oh my God, I love that scene. Anyway, so now that I have had my little freak out, that is it for the Queen of Shadows book talk. I hope you guys enjoyed this book and this book talk, and I will see you guys after my tandem read. Yes, I will be tandem reading Tower of Dawn and Empire of Storms. And it's like not even the 15th of April and I'm more than halfway through the series. So fingers crossed I can finish it.